Good afternoon or good morning, as the case may be, colleagues. Um, welcome to one of my very favorite, perhaps my favorite event of the CGS year, and that is the 3MT Showcase and People's Choice Competition. Um, before we get started, and as um, people begin um, to complete entry into the session, let me start by um, putting up a few guidelines just as a reminder uh, for the event. Um, first, as you know, on a Zoom meeting, it really helps if you keep your microphone muted and your camera off, um, unless the moderator gives us directions to do otherwise. Um, do know that this session is being recorded and that the recording will be available to all participants after the session. Also, please feel free to post questions in the chat and as time allows, um, we will indeed try to respond to those uh, questions during the discussion session, which will follow the vote, voting period as time allows. Now, let's move on to the program. The 3MT event that we are holding today um, really has become an annual CGS tradition. Of course, this year, for all kinds of reasons, our event is a little different. We are bringing our 2020 um, student participants together virtually to celebrate their accomplishments and to learn from their experiences. And we are looking forward to another showcase um, later this year at the end of 2021, when regional winter winners from this year will come together. You know, this past year, I, I suppose it's almost cliche to say has been a year like no other. As, as the world faces a global pandemic, challenges to democracy, ongoing issues of racial injustice, we've been reminded anew that the stakes of good communication about facts and evidence are very, very high indeed. The students and graduate alums who are assembled here with us today, like all graduate students, will play an incredibly important role in establishing the credibility of science and scholarship in conversations about issues that affect us all. Our moderator today is Andrea Galato, Dean of the Graduate College at Texas State University, who will help run our People's Choice competition and engage our talented students in conversation about the 3MT experience. Andrea will be introducing you to our students in just a moment. Andrea, we so appreciate your help. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership in this event. But another very large thanks is due to ProQuest. I'd like to thank ProQuest not only for their support of the 3MT showcase, this event today, but also their longstanding investments in CGS and graduate education. I would especially like to recognize them for a number of important contributions. I hope that many of you were with us, for example, last week as the ProQuest CGS Distinguished Dissertation Awards were conferred with honors um, bestowed on outstanding early career scholars. In addition, ProQuest has been a co-sponsor with ETS of the 2019 Global Summit that focused on the cultural context of health and well being in graduate education, um, an incredibly important topic, uh, the discussion of which catalyzed and has supplemented and reinforced a year long multi year project of CGS on graduate student mental health. And thanks also to ProQuest for continuing to be a very valuable member of the CGS sustaining membership network. So thanks ProQuest, thanks for helping us advance graduate education and research. Thanks for being such a good partner. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Julia Smith to say just a few words. Julia serves as the Director of Academic Relations for ProQuest, where she manages content acquisition relationships with universities in Australia, New Zealand, and North America. Julia has worked in higher education and academic affairs for many years at the University of Michigan, Columbia, and Harvard, and holds a doctorate in higher education research from the University of Michigan. Julia, um, we'd love to have you say a few words. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for those kind words um, about ProQuest and the, the, um, the work that you've enabled us to do uh, with uh, the graduate school community. Um, 
As, as many of you know, ProQuest hosts the largest corpus of dissertations and theses in the world and delivers those works directly to academic researchers in more than 100 uh, excuse me, countries. And so I am delighted to be here today to carry forward this 40 year partnership with CGS. Um, but as the president of our division likes to say, it is the it is the authors who are the real heroes of the work that we do at ProQuest. And so it's with delight and not a small amount of enthusiasm that I congratulate the three MT participants who are here today. Um, you've already made it a, a long way uh, and are tremendously impressive. Um, and I very much look forward to seeing your presentations. Dr. Galato, back to you. All right, wonderful. So um, it is uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you. I'm Andrea Golado. I'm the Dean of the Graduate College at Texas State University. And I'm very excited to be the moderator for this fabulous event. Before we get started, I would like to do a little bit of technical housekeeping. Um, when you look at your screen up on the top right-hand corner, you should have a little button that says view. When you click on that view, you can toggle between standard, side-by-side, -side, and side-by-side -side gallery. For the 3MT presentations, when the students are presenting, it is likely going to be best to pick the side-by-side -side, uh, speaker view. And when you click that, then you can also adjust the size of the image of the person who is presenting so that you can make the slide and the speaker of equal size. That might be helpful in, in the presentations. Okay, so after this technical housekeeping, I would now like to ask all of our student uh, competitors to turn on their videos. Um, it is really wonderful to see all of you here. And if you've seen a 3MT competition before, then you know you are in for a real treat. As you know, the Three Minute Thesis is a research communication competition developed by the University of Queensland in which graduate students have three minutes to present a compelling oration on their thesis or dissertation and its significance using a single non-moving slide. So the 3MT is not an exercise in trivializing research, but instead it challenges students to consolidate their ideas and research discoveries so they can be presented concisely to a non-specialist audience. And today's event features students who were recognized as winners on their respective campuses. And then they are the top two winners at the annual meetings of four regional associations of graduate education in the US and Canada. Those regional organizations are the Conference of Southern Graduate Schools, the Midwestern Association of Graduate Schools, the, the Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools, and the Western Association of Graduate Schools. Unfortunately, the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies is unable to send participants this year due to the timing of their own competitions. But we look forward to including them again in the next year's uh, competition here at CGS. So, now, um, what we will do today is that following the presentations, we will ask this talented group of uh, researchers and communicators to share their experiences about participating in the 3MT so that graduate deans can learn from their insights. And uh, just like last year, CGS will also conduct a People's Choice competition, and the winner will receive a prize of $2,000 um, from ProQuest. So that's very generous and thank you very much. Um, since the 3MT competition is a research communication competition, you, the audience, will not evaluate the merit of the research, but you will evaluate instead how well the research, its findings and impact are communicated and how interested you are in learning more. And we will provide instructions on voting a little bit later on. So to summarize, I'm going to first introduce all the presenters. After I've introduced all the presenters, we will then hear their three-minute presentations. Then we will do a roundtable discussion. 
And I will also take questions in the chat and relay them to the presenters. And um, during that time, we will also be voting for the People's Choice Award. And then finally, um, I will have the pleasure of announcing uh, the winner of the People's Choice Award. So now let me go ahead and introduce this year's participants in the live event. And we should note here that from NAGS, we don't have just two participants, but actually three because they had a tie in their competition. So the presenters are um, from NAGS, Amalia Gill, University of Toronto. Also from NAGS, Erica Graham, University at Albany. Also from NAGS, Catherine Kurtz, Villanova University. From MAGS, Megan LaFollette, Purdue University. From CSGS, Masa Lotfi Marchube from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. From WAGS, Ayumi Manawaru from Washington State University. From CSGS, Allison Mercer Smith, UNC Chapel Hill. And then we will have two presenters who have sent in pre recorded videos because they were unable to attend today. And I will like to remind the audience that we are not going to be considering the mode of presentation live versus uh, pre recorded. It's a pandemic, and so we want it to be as flexible as, as possible. But those two presenters are from WAGS, Katie, uh, Katie Murphy, University of California, Davis, and from MAGS, Balaji Venkata Krishnan from Cleveland State University. So thank you all. And now we are going to get started. I would like to ask all presenters, but the first one, Amalia, to turn off their camera. I'd like to note that I will be timing the participants uh, and I will turn my camera back on when the presenter finishes or when time is up, whichever happens first. Okay, so here we go. Our first presenter is Amalia Gill from the University of Toronto and the title of her presentation is Identifying Distractions in Surgery with Eye Tracking. Let's imagine you're about to have a surgery and you have to pick between one of these two operating rooms to have your surgery in. So which one would you prefer, operating room A or operating room B? If I had to guess, I would say most of you likely picked B and that was a good choice because if any of you picked A, I'm sorry to say, but some of you did not make it out of that surgery. And if you did, you may have long lasting complications. So what happened? Well, as you can see in operating room A, there are a lot of distractions that are affecting the surgeon. There are nuisance alarms, people coming in and out of the room, phones and pagers going off. There's just so many distractions. And this is a huge safety concern. Distractions are a suspected major contributing factor to over 50,000 preventable patient deaths each year in North America. So what can we do to make the operating room a much safer place? Well, I know what you're all thinking. Let's just get rid of all these distractions. But can we really do that? Can we really lock all the doors and don't let anyone in or out? Can we really shut off all phones and pagers? Don't let any communication happen. Well, in reality, these options are not possible or even safe. So maybe instead the answer lies in better understanding when and which distractions had a greater effect on a surgeon's attention. After all, just because the distractions there doesn't mean that the surgeon is necessarily distracted. But how do we obtain this attention information? We can't go into the operating room and ask the surgeon after every distraction. How do you feel? Are you distracted? How about now? That's likely gonna be a lot more distracting. Instead, what I have done is obtain this attention information by tracking the eyes of the surgeon. Eye tracking is a method commonly used to measure visual attention. It works with a set of lights and a camera. The lights create reflections in the eyes and then the camera tracks the location of these reflections. This then gives us information about where, for how long and to what is someone paying attention. Eye tracking has been used before to study distractions but in a simulated operating room. No one has yet done this during live surgeries and that's exactly what we have done. We have installed a custom designed eye tracker in an operating room at San Michael's Hospital in Toronto. We have captured the visual attention of several surgeons during 28 life surgical procedures. We then analyzed the critical steps of these surgeries and, and found that even though phones and room traffic happened most often, they seldom had an effect on a surgeon's visual attention. However, personal conversations, which occurred less frequently, were found to have the greatest effect. 
We are now analyzing other steps in these surgeries to identify any additional distractions of concern. We will then use this information to develop and test strategies to mitigate these distractions. This can help us create a much safer operating room. That way, no one here nor anyone else has to ever worry about in which operating room they're about to have their surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Our next presenter is Erica Graham from the University at Albany. And the title of her presentation is How Close is Too Close? Imagine a technology that can send digital information close to the speed of light. A technology so compact, it can conveniently fit in the palm of your hand. By harnessing the power of light, that reality, it's already here. If you've ever searched on Google, posted a photo to Facebook, or even uploaded your story to Instagram, then you have actively benefited from a technology called photonics. Its working principles are based on how efficiently photons, which are the elementary particles that make up light, are able to send data from one point to another. So when I update my LinkedIn profile, the words I've typed are digitized into ones and zeros and encoded onto pulses of photons at a transmitter chip on the left of the slide. It's then sent through a photonic wire to its destination at a receiver chip on the right. It's ultimately turned back into words where a potential employer could read my bio. A photonic systems, just like the one I described, can transmit data at a rate of 400 gigabits per second. That's equivalent to transmitting 252 million tweets. My research is based on a unique type of photonics called silicon nanophotonics. Now, structures used on this platform have geometries on the order of tens of nanometers. That's 400 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. Their compact size means more structures can be squeezed onto the transmitter and receiver chip for increased functionality of your devices. But therein lies the trouble. You see, there's a limit to how close these structures can be before one optically interferes with the other and absorbs light away. As a result, the speed of light is reduced and the rate in which your devices can send and receive data slows. So how close is too close? This is the question my dissertation seeks to answer. Now, to understand this phenomenon, I used a laser to shine light through the nanostructures, which are fabricated on a patented computer chip design. By characterizing the output of this light, I've identified the sizes, the distances, and the material properties of the structures that have the most profound effect on the loss of light. Simulation models and experimental testing have both confirmed there's a strong correlation between these parameters and light loss. From this work, I've developed the first ever set of design guidelines needed to eliminate these factors affecting the data rate and this type of nanophotonic system. Eventually, my research will influence the designs for the next generation of data communication that can travel faster, further. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Our next presenter is Catherine Kurtz from Villanova University. And the title of her presentation is Deviant Bodies, Representations of Female Monstrosity. I wanna talk about how I got ready for this presentation, but I don't mean practicing my pitch. I mean the things that I do roughly every day. Shower, shave, style my hair, moisturize my skin, apply makeup, which means foundation, concealer, lipstick, blush, mascara, squeeze into shape where to get dressed. And that's the abridged version. My point is that as a woman, I do an awful lot of work just to look womanly. And some of the things that I do to look nice are actually pretty horrifying. And sure, I don't have to do these things, but if I'm being honest, without them, I feel a bit frightening. This irony is at the heart of my work on the philosophy of monsters. The connection between women and monsters has a long history that goes as far back as ancient philosopher Aristotle, who said that a monster is when nature deviates from its type. 
And the first deviation is when a female is formed instead of a male. Yikes. What if all the work women do to appear feminine is related to a deeply internalized belief that we are by nature deformed monsters? Now a response to this view comes from none other than the author of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley. In a time when it was considered unnatural for women to publish, Shelley was aware of her own deviation from the norm. But her message is that monsters aren't born, they're made. What makes us monsters is what we become to survive a hostile world. My research applies this philosophical framework to examples from art, literature, and popular culture where women represent themselves as monsters. In my analysis, I ask, what do these representations express and what do they achieve? Overall, what I found in these images are confrontations with the misogynistic beliefs that lurk in our minds and in society. These women are using monsters to reclaim an image that stigmatized them and use it as a tool to do what monsters do best, which is dismantle the systems that create them. My work shows that representations of monstrosity can alert us to ongoing forms of oppression and give viewers the opportunity to confront the ugly truth themselves. This is a crucial step in creating a more just and free world. And sure, like monsters, change is scary. But the alternative, objectification, dehumanization, and violation, it's not pretty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Megan LaFollette from Purdue University. And the title of her presentation is Tickling Rats for Superior Science. Did you know that you can tickle rats? Yes, I did just mean to say those two words together. Tickle, like coochie-coo, I'm gonna get you, and rats, those little rodents that you might consider to be pests in your barn or home. Well, the rats that I work with certainly aren't pests. Rather, they're an essential part of scientific research, including developing treatments for heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. But unfortunately, when I first interact with this little guy, he's afraid of me and likely views me as a predator. And then I have to do scary things to him, like give him injections to study a new drug. This causes him stress, which changes his behavior, hormones, and even brain structure. And that's not good for rat welfare or scientific quality. So what do we do? Well, we tickle rats. But why and what does that even mean? Well, have you ever seen puppies running around, wrestling and playing with each other? Maybe you've joined in, had fun, and formed a bond. Well, young rats actually play in a manner very similar to young puppies. But of course, I can't use my whole body to play with a little rat. So instead I use my hand to mimic rat play and tickle rats. But does this technique really work? Well, my research reviewing over 50 rat tickling experiments shows that it does. The rats love it. It makes them happy, less afraid of us, and less stressed. They even make ultrasonic vocalizations, which are a gold standard measure of positive emotions and a rat version of laughter. If they really love it, they'll run around, chase your hand, and even literally jump for joy. But unfortunately, my research also shows that this great technique is rarely used. Less than 12% of caretakers tickle their rats mostly because they think the required 10 minutes per rat is just too long, but it doesn't have to be. My research also shows that you can tickle a rat for just 45 seconds and get the same beneficial results. So 
In the end, my research is a piece of the work trying to improve animal welfare and scientific quality. So the next time that you hear these two unexpected words together, tickling rats, you'll know what they mean. It's not about pests, it's about improving scientific quality and the lives of these wonderful little animals. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, our next speaker is um, Masa Lotvi Machube from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. And the title of her presentation is a miniaturized neural probe for simultaneous detection of chemicals in the brain. The brain is the most important organ you have. Well, according to the brain, it starts working even before you're born and never stops until you're hungry. The brain is very complicated and there are many chemicals in it, but the three most famous ones are dopamine, the molecule of motivation and reward, adrenaline, the molecule of excitement, and noradrenaline, the molecule of fear. These compounds make us who we are and they regulate a lot of our body's functions such as sleep, mood, and memory. Their imbalances are associated with catastrophic mental health issues, such as substance abuse, Parkinson's disease, and depression. Let me give you some numbers. Between 2010 to 2019, around 20 million Americans experienced a major depressive episode every year. Since the pandemic, this number has tripled. A recent study shows that graduate students are six times more likely to experience depression and substance abuse than the general public. Mental health has become an important topic in conferences like the CGS. So my point is that studying and understanding the brain and its disorders is important and urgent, but also very difficult. The brain consists of 20 billion interconnected neurons. On your shoulders is sitting the most complex and sensitive single object on the face of the universe. Any foreign object that is to be inserted into the brain needs to be extremely small so as to not cause tissue damage. For my research, I have designed and fabricated a miniaturized neural probe, you can see in the slide, with a shank as thin as a single strand of hair, but strong enough so it won't bend or break during insertion or take out. It is also long enough to reach the deeper areas of the brain where the action is happening. On such a small probe, there are nine gold microband electrodes capable of measuring currents and electric potentials and associate them with concentrations of chemicals being released in the brain. To make this probe, light was used as a pen to write on multiple layers of polymer and gold. The state of the art process is so sensitive that dust in the air or my own skin particles are considered contaminations. The data we have collected from these probes are very promising and lead to, for the first time, simultaneous measurement of dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline in real time as they're being released in the brain in very low concentrations. Hopefully through my research and many more, we'll be able to understand a little better the organ with which we think we think. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. And our next presenter is Ayumi Manawadu from Washington State University. And the title of her presentation is The Bridge Doctor. Even in your worst nightmare, have you imagined falling off a broken bridge with your car? I bet most of you would have said, are you kidding? No, but trust me, after I started working on my dissertation, I have. Let me tell you why. For that, let's think of a civil engineer as a doctor and a concrete bridge as a patient. Just like us, concrete bridges also have a lifespan. 
They age, get ill, and eventually fail. About two in every five bridges in the United States are reaching this lifespan as we speak. And it is just a matter of time till the next bridge collapses, unless properly diagnosed and promptly treated. However, there is no robust technique to detect hidden symptoms in concrete bridges to treat them on time. But how cool would it be if there was a portable tool, something like a stethoscope for concrete structures? Well, that is a long journey, but to reach there, I'm investigating the effectiveness of using externally bonded smart sensors in monitoring the overall health of concrete. The sensors and actuators I use are piezoelectric, meaning they produce electricity with applied pressure and vice versa. But how do they work? Suppose there is an actuator and a sensor bonded to the external surface of the structure. When you supply an electric signal to this actuator, it generates vibrations that travel through the concrete, but you cannot see or hear them. Instead, we use this sensor to convert them back to electric signals, which we can view. Much like your doctor who listens to your unusually beating heart through the stethoscope to tell you how ill you are, I compare these input and output signals visually to tell how ill the concrete is. Hence, my mom calls me the bridge doctor. And that figure on the slide is my version of how she sees me. Did it work? We use this concept to detect material degradation and collision damages of concrete specimens. After combining with a bit of math and post-processing tools, yes, it worked. Currently, we are investigating if it is as effective, if not, how to improve this technology to detect other problematic symptoms such as cracking and debonding of concrete. Well, my hope is that this promising and affordable technology will someday influence the development of a stethoscope for concrete bridges. Then, although the bridges will continue to crack, we will be ready with an army of bridge doctors to make a stitch in time and save thousands of lives. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, we will now come to our last live presentation. And uh, the presenter is Alison Mercer Smith from UNC Chapel Hill. And the title of her presentation is Turning Skin Cells into Cancer Killers. When I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And I was extremely lucky because my doctors were able to catch my cancer early before it could spread. Generally, cancer is much easier to treat when it's just in one area. I study lung cancer. And when that cancer is in one spot, a patient has a 60% chance of surviving for five years. But if that cancer spreads far away, that number drops down to only 6%. Lung cancer is also the most likely cancer to spread to the brain. And if it does, a patient typically has only months. But what if there was a way to very precisely target and treat just the spots of cancer without harming the healthy tissue? And what if we could do this very precise treatment using a patient's own skin? Our lab aims to do just this by turning skin cells into stem cells. Stem cells have the remarkable natural ability to seek out cancer. So we can give skin cells that same ability to find cancer by reprogramming them into stem cells. But what happens when these skin cells turn stem cells actually make it to the tumor? I like to think of these cells as like Pac-Man. In order for Pac-Man to be able to eat a ghost, or in our case, a tumor, Pac-Man has to eat a power pellet. Our version of a power pellet is a gene that enables these cells to pump out a drug that very precisely kills just cancer. On the screen, you can see what we expect this therapy to actually look like in a person. A patient with lung cancer comes into clinic and we can take a sample of their skin. We can then reprogram those skin cells into stem cells 
And then we can give those cells that power pellet, that gene that enables these cells to pump out that anti-cancer drug. And finally, we can give the patient back their own Pac-Man cells. Essentially, we're trying to reprogram a patient's own cells to find and kill their cancer. Our technology is not limited to one area of the body. In our lab models, we've shown that these Pac-Man cells can track down multiple spots of lung cancer, not just in the lungs, but lung cancer that is spread to the brain. More importantly, they can reduce tumor growth and extend survival. Ultimately, we hope to one day use a patient's own cells to fight back against their cancer. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now we have two participants who have submitted videos. And the first video presentation is from Katie Murphy from the University of California, Davis. And the title of her presentation is Feeling Sick, How Corn Makes Its Own Medicine. Have you had lunch yet today? Yes, I'm, I actually mean you. And if you haven't had lunch, are you looking forward to it? More importantly, would you like to be able to eat lunch 20 years from now? Okay, I'm gonna assume that's just about everybody. My name is Katie Murphy, or as my students call me, the Corn Queen, and I'm working to ensure food for our future. The unfortunate reality is that 20 years from now, we expect 2 billion more people on this planet. That's 2 billion more mouths to feed. Given current production levels, we simply cannot produce enough food. Lunch in the future could become a luxury. Now, my graduate research at University of California, Davis, works to solve this problem. How do we grow more food using less resources? We stop losing crops to plant disease. Now, just like humans, plants get sick. And when they do, our food dies in the field and never makes it to your plate. Now, the nasty moldy ear of corn that you see right here is caused by a fungal disease. This fungus causes 10% crop loss of corn every year. Now, if you're not eating a buttery ear of corn like this for lunch today, I can guarantee you that you're eating something made with a corn product or you're eating something that has eaten corn. It is the backbone of the American food supply. What a 10% crop loss looks like is a cornfield that covers the entire state of Maryland, rendered totally inedible. If we can rescue some of this crop from disease, we can grow more food. Now, my graduate research has uncovered a new group of chemicals that corn makes in response to this disease. Here, corn acts as its own doctor, sensing that it's under attack, diagnosing itself with disease, and producing its own medicines, antibiotics really, to fight off this fungus. Interestingly, we've only ever seen these chemicals in corn, not in any other plant. We now know the structure of these chemicals, we know the genes that control their production, and how they're working as antibiotics to fight off fungal attack. I did so by taking the genes from corn and putting them into a bacteria that I can grow in the lab in order to make these chemicals and figure out what they do. Now that I have this knowledge of these naturally produced plant antibiotics, I can begin to reduce crop losses. Now, they do call me the corn queen, but I love all plants. So using breeding and genetics, we can make corn varieties and other crops that can produce their own medicines. This will reduce our current pesticide use, grow us more food, and generate stronger crops to ensure food for our future. Thank you. Yeah, the voting rules up here pretty soon. Yes, okay, so we will now go on uh, to the next round, namely the, the voting. So um, the, um, oops, I can't read the entire slide because there is a material covering the slide. Um, so uh, what will happen is, uh, um, so that we will be voting and um, the voting will op be open for uh, five minutes in total. And there will be a URL that is going to be in the chat. And we are asking you not to share uh, the uh, URL. 
and each Zoom attendee may have one vote. And um, if multiple users are logged on from a single device, that device may only vote once. So if you are, have been watching this as a, as a group, then you get one vote as a group. And um, a slide will then be displayed during the voting that will include the names of each presenter and also the thumbnail image of their, of their slide. So now remember that when you are voting, you are not evaluating the merit of the research. You are evaluating the skills of the presenter as a communicator. So you will be uh, evaluating how well the research and its significance has been communicated, both orally and visually. And you also evaluate how engaging you found it. So would you like to learn more? So I'm hoping that we will get the uh, link to the vote in the chat in a minute. see that? I have not seen the link just yet. Um, okay. Can we advance the slide? Okay. And I'm going to read the names because they are uh, partially covered by something on the presenter's screen. I assume that's a chat vin window or um, another window. There we go. Um, so the uh, um, there will be a survey monkey URL in uh, in the Zoom chat, hopefully soon. And um, our presenters in order were Amelia Gill, Erica Graham, number three, Catherine Kurtz, Megan LaFollette, Masa Lotfi Machube. Ayumi Manawadu, uh, Alison Mercer, Katie Murphy, and um, uh, Balaji um, Venkada Krishnan. So um, do we have the link in the chat? There we go. Quickly, before anybody else posts anything in the chat, go to the chat and you can find uh, the link there. And this is going to be up for five minutes. We'll be, um, uh, the voting is open for five minutes. And in the meantime, I'm going to be asking our wonderful presenters uh, some questions. And I'm uh, asking one person each time to kind of jump in and then others to, uh, to also respond. So I think one question that all of us watching this have um, on our minds is that uh, participating seems kind of a daunting uh, thing to do because you have to speak in front of a large audience. So why did you decide to participate in the 3MT and what have you gained personally from the participation? Um, and I'm gonna look here who I see on my screen. Um, Catherine, do you wanna start out with that question? Sure, thank you. Uh, I wanted to participate in this because I love performing and I saw this as an opportunity to perform, uh, which for me means that you are trying to communicate a message to a large audience in a way that's engaging. And if I'm spending as much time on my dissertation work as I am, it would be really nice to be able to communicate it effectively to a wide audience. So uh, I think that this gave me an opportunity to do that for which I'm very grateful. And uh, yeah, that's why I did this. Perfect. Any other of you want to want to jump in here with uh, additional comments? Um, so one thing that I really liked about the three minute thesis competition is that it focuses on how to communicate with people who aren't necessarily in your field. And I'm an MD PhD student. And so it's always in the top of my mind of how can you communicate with your patients? How can you explain um, research and you know how medicine works to someone who isn't necessarily in this field and do that very quickly. So I also saw this as kind of a an exercise to uh, become a better communicator for my patients. Perfect. All right. Anything else to add to that from anybody of you? Um, so I think uh, why I participated in the, this competition is like you get to think where your research fits in the big picture. So that kind of um, helps you to rethink about your research. What are you exactly going to do at the end? 
So that is kind of, uh, was kind of very nice for me to realize what am I finally going to do with my research? Well, how will it be applicable to the current uh, technology and how will it be applicable to the future sort of thing? That's why I participated. Great, great, wonderful. Any, any other comments? All right, then let me go on to the next question. So due to the pandemic, all of you have delivered at least one virtual 3MT presentation this past year. So what did you observe about the shift from kind of a face-to-face co-present presentation to a virtual presentation? Was it difficult? What did you learn? Was it better? What, what are your thoughts? Amalia, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely challenging because I had practiced so for so long to do it live. And, and as you saw from my presentation, the first part of it is really engaging the, the, the audience. So I would ask, can you put your hands up? And clearly you can't do that with a, with a virtual presentation. So that was a little bit challenging to, to kind of keep that flow and the, that engagement. Um, so yeah, definitely it was a, a lot more challenging, but once you, once you have to switch, you really have to just practice again and get more feedback from others. So I would, you know, go on zoom with other friends and things like that and present to them and say, Hey, does this work? Mm -hmm. And I think what I really, really learned through that was to be, uh, quite flexible and not stuck on one way and also to really understand the audience and the medium that you're trying to communicate through because that has a completely different effect so that was even though it was a challenging experience it was a, it was a really great experience to be able to 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 know how to change from one medium to another and still keep that engagement perfect anybody perfect. else yeah. yeah, I'll add something as well. Um, I mean, I think you hear this a lot, but um, I really enjoyed, I got to do my first 3MT live mm -hmm. and I get a lot of energy from being up on stage, seeing the audience, seeing the reactions, just moving around the stage. And so that was really um I just really enjoyed it a lot. And when it moved to truly virtual, um, it was a lot harder because yeah, you can't move around. You don't have any immediate feedback. Um, I also um, struggled a bit even today with when you're live, all you have to do is walk on stage. You don't have anything else to worry about. But when you're virtual, you have to make sure it's not that many steps, but somehow just turning on your video, turning on your microphone, turning on your own timer, making sure that you're framed correctly. I feel like in some ways there's actually more responsibilities put on the individual when you are doing it virtual versus for live, you just show up walk out on stage and do it. And for some that might be more terrifying, um, but at least for me, I've actually found it much more uh, of a struggle to do everything by myself. But at the same time, this is the world we live in. Um, I actually work in a remote position. So um, in some ways it's it's really good practice for real life and just how how life is now. And, and like Amalia said, being really flexible. Yeah, great. Hey, Erica, you have your mic open. Yeah, so I'd like to kind of parrot what Megan said um, with not really being able to see um, how the audience is perceiving your message um, can really throw you off a little bit. Um, and presenting virtually for me, because I can't see the audience, I get comfortable, I get relaxed, and I'm not as in tune with what I'm saying. So I'm more likely to... Um, to make a little snafu here or there. So uh, definitely what Amali was saying and practicing um, uh, with friends on Zoom definitely gets you prepared for um, the actual virtual competition. And one thing that has really helped me is kind of mimicking, uh, putting my pl myself in a place where I'm mimicking um, an environment where I would be presenting in person. That kind of snaps me back into the realization that, okay, no, I'm on, I have to be uh, really in tune. I have to be really focused with what I'm doing and not lose um, and not lose sight of that, so. Perfect. Yeah. Well, you've all um, highlighted various kinds of uh, difficulties. I bet though that the audience would have never guessed that you found this difficult because you all made it look so easy and so natural, like you, you are doing this all the time, but you're absolutely right. Speaking into the void and not having any kind of a reaction 
from any kind of uh, audience or co-participant is, is really is really odd. It's not something that we do or at, until recently that we haven't done on a, on a daily basis. Um, you've already touched upon this a little bit, giving advice to uh, future 3MT competitions. Many of them might continue virtually. Um, you know, what kind of advice you have for, for students who want to participate. You mentioned practicing, 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 practicing with friends on Zoom. Um, what, what, other, what other good practice tips, if we had to do a, a little document as a cheat sheet for students, uh, what are other good practices to, to do in an event like this? What worked for you? Um, who can we? Masa, do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think that in line with uh, the concept of practicing, uh, I think that it's also very important that you practice to a diverse uh, group of people. Uh, you know, like I practice with my advisor just to make sure that uh, I'm simplifying the science to the point I'm not saying something that doesn't make sense. And then I'm practicing with my uh, graduate school staff just uh, because they have more experience with presentations and then I'm, um, I'm presenting to my family who are just non-scientists and, um, you know, all sorts of different audience would help uh, getting feedback and saying, okay, I, I love this joke, but I don't get it. And then, okay, then I, I, I probably should change it. Um, I think that it's very important that you diversify whoever you're practicing with. That really helped. Great. One thing that I'll add as well that I think often gets missed when you're doing, you know, a longer form talk is I actually found it really useful to when I was live to actually script out when I was going to move and when I was virtual to actual script out my pot like when I was going to take a longer pause um, because three minutes although in some ways it's very short, in other ways it's actually quite long. And so if you can break up your talk with like a little bit of silence, it's super, it's super weird. Um, it feels really weird to do. Um, and like, it's hard to force yourself to do it when you're getting like really excited in the moment. But at the same time, I think it is a really important um, speaking technique that's again kind of specialized to this specific form and length of presentation. You don't you don't have to worry as much about that in other forms, but definitely those those pauses. And if you do ever get to do it live, like if you have movement, scripting those out, scripting out your hand gestures, um, but also trying to make it feel natural at the same time. It's it's always a bit of a, a challenge. So yeah. That's that's great advice. I've never heard that, but that makes perfect uh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Other tips that you have. Um, I was just um, add to Megan's so point. I completely agree. Uh, silence can often be much more powerful than words, um, and as part of that, I think less is more. So I had to cut out quite a bit of a lot of my first drafts uh, because I didn't have any time to actually perform it. Um, I only had time to kind of motor mouth my way through it. So I would say include less information, but allow yourself more time to really like explain it and give yourself time to breathe with it. Perfect. And Ayumi, you had a, you put your microphone on too. Yes. So this was my first 3MT virtual presentation because uh, the last two, three, four, five, I don't know, all this <laughs> live. So it was kind of, kind of challenging for me to set up for days. You had to think about everything. The one thing I noticed is everyone says, okay, guys, you, when you're delivering a presentation, you have to keep eye contact. But in a virtual presentation, how? So the funny thing is, so I have hosted like a couple of presentations and how I keep eye contact is I usually look at the little icons of people on Zoom, but actually it doesn't work. When I checked my recording later, it's as if like, like I'm sleeping, like I'm <laughs> like half asleep and looking at people, but actually I'm very engaged. I'm looking at the people. So one thing I would suggest that if you're doing a virtual pre presentation, you have to practice with the camera, talk to the camera. I think that's the best way to keep eye contact. That's a, that's a very good tip, yes. And I'm noticing that I'm also looking at your images right now. So yes, that's all practice looking at the, the camera. Very, very good. Um, so uh, there's one question that I don't have here on my little script that we kind of practiced before, but uh, none of you had any kind of hiccups in your presentations. 
Um, uh, I don't know if you actually all said the scripted speech that you had prepared, or if um, you know you uh, um, went ahead and um, uh, were a little improvising in between. But um, you know, sometimes we've seen presentation where somebody has memorized it, and then they have like a little brain freeze, and they can't keep going. So how? What did you do so this wouldn't happen to you? Erica. So uh, the first year I competed in this competition, 2019, um, I made changes to my script last minute and um, I was in the final round. And in the last sentence, I blinked. I forgot everything I was gonna say. And I stood there until the time ran out on me and I was disqualified. So the next year, what I did was I practiced um, three hours each day, the week leading up. So that would never happen again. Also speed talking through your presentation. So the, the funny thing about that is if you speed talk, that means you committed it to memory. The hiccups you make while you're speed talking, those are the areas of your um, script that you need to pay special attention to. So yeah, that's, that's how I've prepared. Great, great. That's a very good, very good tip. Any yeah. others? Yeah, I'll actually speak to, to Erica's point there in terms of, I think one thing that really helped me in, when practicing, it's that, that, that speed talking, but, and also doing it to time. So don't worry, don't worry about what I was saying, just looking at the time and knowing that when I hiccup, I just had to keep going. So that helped me practice to know if I hiccup, I just got to say something just to get me out of that rut and keep going. So that really helped and it happens often. So at least I know if I hiccup, I know what to say and that, that instance. So that really, really helped. Okay. Other tips, Allison? I found that I was most likely to hiccup at transition points. So if you were to think of the speech in like paragraphs, I'd be most likely to hiccup at the end of the paragraph and go, oh, wait, what comes next? So I just focused on last sentence of a paragraph and then the next sentence of the next paragraph and just did that a bunch of times. And I will say I did that about an hour ago as well, just, just to be sure. It worked. <laughs> it worked for all of you. Yes. Any other uh, tips along those lines? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. Okay, go, ahead. go ahead, Catherine. Um, echo what Allison said about the transitions. I found those were pretty tricky too. So just saying it over and over again, your mouth actually starts to form the muscle memory. So you just kind of, it's almost like your mouth starts going before your brain catches up to where you are. And that has definitely saved me because I'm glad it didn't show in my presentation, but there were definitely a few moments where I was like, oh, right, this is where I am. So yeah. No, nobody could tell. Ayumi, you wanted to say something too, and I know Masa wanted to, we will get you both. Yeah, so uh, when I practice, uh, yeah, practicing is definitely important. So when I practice, wherever I had hiccups, I tried to incorporate a pause, re really, because I realized, okay, every time I do it, there's some, something like that. So why not add a pause there? Okay, ask a question, add a pause, then you have like time to think and the audience to grab it. What did you ask? So that is one thing I did. And another thing to add to this point. Um, so I have realized that when you're giving a, like a live presentation, it's best if you kind of go to that setting, you picture, okay, this is the stage and that's the audience and kind of present, but in front of the uh, mirror, as well as kind of project yourself onto the live audience and imagine the audience and then present. But in here, I would suggest record yourself, record yourself, and then check how you're doing. That's a very painful thing to do, to record oneself and watch oneself. Masa, what, do you, what other advice do you have? Uh, what, what really helped me was uh, that I just broke into my spiel, uh, just uh, when I was doing something that wasn't even related during the day. Uh, so I had my spiel ready. It's been probably about a few months because I've done this before. And like I'm in the middle of chopping some vegetables and I go, the brain is the most important organ you have. <laughs> 
this, uh, just with, with distractions around me so that my brain really internal internalizes it. And um, also I realized that if I say it before I fall asleep, uh, just the few minutes, not only does it help me fall asleep because it's uh, at this point, it's so, uh, I don't have to think about what I'm saying, uh, but it also like, there have been times that I woke up in the middle of the night and I say, how many million Americans experience depression? And so I think at this point I can wake up in the middle of the night and just say it. <laughs> That's amazing. That is truly amazing. And what wonderful tips really um, for, for future um, contestants. Um, so what, what other um, advice, is there any, anything else um, if you, uh, you know, had to give advice to your past self now that you've been through it and made it all the way to this final, um, are there any, um, um, any other things that you would want to, um, to share with people or any kind of a funny story of things that didn't work well? Anything at all? Yeah, there's one for me and, and Erica and Catherine were privy to this was when uh, we were doing the NAGS one. Uh, I had technical difficulties as soon as I started. I couldn't see myself. I could barely hear anything. And so I had that quick second of like, do are other people seeing me? If I can't see me, can everyone else see me? And I just, I just had that quick, like I should stop, but you're trained not to. So that was, that was a panic complete, but I'm like, if I keep going and no one's seeing me and I can't see me, this is not going to work out. So I stopped. I was like, Oh, sorry. I can't, it's not working. Can I start again? And it was complete panic. Um, but I think with virtual, I think people understand about the technical difficulties. So it's good to ask the organizers and everything like that. I think we did that here. So that was really great to ask all of this and really have it all figured out a week before how it all would flow. Even Dr. Galato, you saying that you don't have to start right away as soon as I stop. That was huge. That I think that helped a lot. It um, helped me too, because I had to get my mouse over to where the timer was, right? So I had <laughs> this panic moment on my side that you'd start immediately, right? Before I yeah. stop my camera. Yes, but it's a very good point that um, um, meeting with the contestants and really talking the event through, whether it is an in-person event or a live event, is huge because, um, um, and having seen the venue, I think also helps, right? If you've been in the venue before, if you've seen it, if you've, um, we, uh, in our week, uh, um, the meeting last week, we even did, we practiced the transitions between speakers. We didn't practice the whole, whole of your, your speech. We didn't want to give anything away, um, but I did the introduction and each of you did the initial sentence of your presentation just so we could practice how that that would feel and yeah so that makes everybody feel at ease and I think your point of uh, really discussing the what ifs um, um, are, are good things to do what if there are technical difficulties what if the zoom connection breaks down I even uh, wrote to CGS and said the last time I did a live event our fire extinguisher went on in the building. Um, what do we do if that happens, right? I mean, you want, you want to talk about those, those things and have a backup plan. So, so yes. So I would like to encourage our audience, the, all the deans and other uh, spectators here in the, in the group to put some questions in the chat. We will get to them in a few minutes, but I want to ask um, a couple of more questions because you have such great insights. And it's so wonderful to hear about your experiences and your perspectives on, on this event and on communicating science in general. So really the past year has shown us how important it is to communicate clearly and effectively with the public about science and about scholarship. And um, with COVID-19, we are constantly receiving breaking news about the latest research. And we are trying to understand the implications for our own health and the health of our families. Um, how has the pandemic made you think differently about um, research, science, scholarly contributions, um, creative endeavors? Uh, I was just gonna take this one because I heard an amazing talk by Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, who is the head of the Moderna effort at NIH. And we asked her the same question when she came to a, a virtual talk to us. And she said, you have to meet people where they are. So a lot of that is doing a lot of listening to the other person, trying to find out what their concerns are. So she gave the example of um, the vaccine has a, a microchip in it. 
And so she spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly why people thought that and where that information came from. So she actually did a lot of listening and learning in the process of doing scientific communication. And then I think the other part of that is trying to use words that the other person can understand. And like, I can very easily go off and, well, I don't know about easily, <laughs> I'm not an immunologist, but I could pretend like I'm an immunologist and start talking about B cells and T cells, but that ultimately won't help someone who isn't an immunologist or is, isn't familiar with that. Um, and so I've learned that myself in talking to my family members about uh, coronavirus and trying to find our common language to explain what's going on. Very good, very helpful. Anybody else? One thing that I can add, <laughs> sorry, um, sure. is I have certainly um, found the value in making analogies meeting where people are, because especially with the pandemic, a lot of people have no conception of how the immune system works. And it's really hard. Like if you just explain how it works without an analogy, a lot of people kind of turn off and they don't, they don't get it. So kind of what Allison said, you know, relating it back to what their interest, do they have an interest? Do they have a sport? So I actually explained, you know, how vaccines works to a friend who does acro yoga. And I use training for acro yoga and different risks of, you know, being a beginner versus actually training and related that to getting vaccinated and how the immune system works. Because a lot of people just have no idea. And it's, it's complex. And it's kind of one of those things where sometimes as a graduate student, you're like, well, I don't want to dumb it down. You know, this is really complicated. Like, I don't want to misrepresent things. Um, and you, you want to be careful of that, that you're not misrepresenting things, but you also have to recognize if you don't make it simpler and make it easier, then your message isn't going to get across anyways. Um, and so it is, it is difficult, it's challenging, and it's a difficult balance to walk because we're so trained to be, to be skeptical, to talk about evidence, to give qualifications of, well, this suggests this, or this might be this, or we have a, you know, this percent confidence. And so it's, it's very different communicating to scientists at your academic conferences versus the public. And it's, it's definitely a very difficult skill or a different skill that I think the pandemic has only um, made more evident, so. Yes, and the people who um, you know, uh, win in these various rounds, they exactly use the techniques that, that you, you say. You, you present it in, um, in simpler language, but not necessarily simpler science, right? And I uh, use analogy and images and pictures, and you all did. Every single one of you did that and did that really well. That was very, very noticeable. But uh, I do think, you know, what you were saying is that you know, communicating to different audiences uh, scientists, et cetera, is, is really important. And I think in a lot of degree programs, we really practice preparing students for the science conferences or for the research conferences or um, where, where students are speaking to their peers, whether this is in science, in the humanities and social sciences, doesn't matter the field. We all train our students to do precisely that, but we don't necessarily train students to speak about their findings to a lay audience, to a general audience. And I think this is what makes this competition so extra special, that this is exactly what is required here and what we really can see um, the public, the world, the world needs, right? So this is, this is uh, truly wonderful. Anybody else? Erica, you seem to be ready to want to talk or did I, did I miss? No, uh... you, really, you really spoke to me right there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the, the language we use saying, within a standard deviation, um, the data suggests. And it's so odd to me that that can be taken and misconstrued into um, someone else's narrative. Mm -hmm. So even the language we as a scientist and engineers have come to find acceptable and correct is no longer working in this uh, type of environment to adequately convey what's really going on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do think tailoring the delivery of the message um, to people depending on their understanding and, and definitely meeting them where they are um, is definitely the, the best 
way to do that. I find that using a funnel type of method where I start off really broad, then as I progress, I start getting more detailed into um, my explaining of the science, of course, by leaving out the jargon because that's not necessarily helping me in this, uh, this uh, particular situation. Um, definitely leads me to be more relatable to the individual and uh, most importantly, be more uh, of a trustworthy source to uh, disseminate scientific information to them. Wonderful. Excellent. I'm going to move to some questions here from the from the audience because there are some really, really good questions in the in the chat. And so one question. So you talked about preparing for the um, oral piece of the presentation. And here is a question of uh, uh, one uh, member in the audience, they were wondering if you could comment on your process of creating the single slide, because that slide is so important. And so what was your, your process? What are some principles, tips, whatever you can use there? And I think I would like to hear from each and every one of you on, on that one. And I'm just going to uh, look here at um, uh, who pops up on my little Hollywood squares uh, first, and that's Megan. Can you, can you say something about how you created your slide? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually have pretty strong opinions on this that are sometimes considered current controversial, but I am actually very um, in favor of using a picture, um, a real picture, preferably if, if it's appropriate of a human or an animal that is looking at the camera. And this image should be one image that's the full width and height of the screen. Um, and the reason of that is if we think about humans' visual attention is that we are um, evolutionarily, um, it's advantageous for us to pay attention to other people and other animals. And so people automatically connect with that slide, they engage with their slide. Um, so of course, this isn't, you know, you have to have a topic that you can make this appropriate for. But if you do, I think you should take advantage of that because it is such a innate thing that humans pay attention to. We, we want to look people and animals in the eyes. They kind of set off these positive emotions in us. Um, and then people aren't for the first three sentences of your talk. They're not looking at your slide, reading it, trying to figure out, trying to guess what's going to happen. Again, different people have different perspectives um, and different things obviously can work because we can see all of these people here today are winners and all these people have have very different slides but personally that was um, why i had my slide the way it was i used to have even words on it and i took those off because i wanted people to just emotionally engage with my topic but pay attention to what i was saying so okay. All right, Catherine. And I was also very fortunate, I will say, to have a wonderful communications department at Purdue who I had a rat photo shoot with for a different <laughs> project and they happened to capture the cutest picture of the cutest little rat. So I will say I feel very, very fortunate um, to have such a great, great communications department at Purdue to work with me. So, yeah. yeah. Great. So Catherine, how about you? What, do you, what are your thoughts on the tips for the slide? So the slide is one of the things that initially drew me into the competition itself, because when I learned about 3MT, I started watching some videos of former presenters and uh, one of the winning performances or presentations was this woman who had a blank slide as her slide. And it was really, uh, it, it was very, you know, provocative, even though it was a blank slide and it's because of the way that she utilized it. Um, into her presentation. And so it made me think of how I could provide a slide that didn't just provide content, but actually performed what I was trying to get across. And so uh, the, the slide image that I ended up using was a picture I had taken of myself, not for this reason, but I just, you know, put a face mask on and it scared me so much that I sent a picture of it to my sister saying, look how horrifying this is. And then it turned out to be completely what I needed for my presentation. So, um, so yeah, I, it was, I was very pleased with that happy accident. Yeah. And uh, Masa, well, how about you? 
Um, what I have learned uh, in line with what uh, Megan and Catherine have said is um, to keep your slide minimal um, because usually the speed of the spiel is so fast and there's just so much information in there that I realize that if the audience takes their attention because we usually can pay attention to one thing, you know, and if your slide is full of data or something that the audience needs to uh, try to interpret it usually they they stop listening to you um i think that just a single image uh, something very minimal um uh, is uh, the best way to go um i i that's that's been my experience i think uh, most people would agree great anybody else anything else we've got all you gotten erica yeah so for me, it was difficult to find just one image to summarize um, my data, my research, my topic um, adequately. Um, and so unfortunately, I did have to go with putting um, more images and, and words on my, on my slide. Um, but I tried my hardest to um, make it as simple as possible. And what I ended up with was this kind of circle of life kind of thing going on. You start with one thing, then it goes to this thing, then you end up with the other thing. So really um, puts, it, puts it right there for the viewer. And I refer back to it in my presentation twice. So um, I, I thought that was adequate enough to at least convey more um, engineering type uh, of research. Cool. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I agree with Erika. I had the same problem. Okay. How to put like one slide, one image. And actually I didn't find an image that would necessarily say, okay, this is what I'm going to say. So I drew it. I drew it by hand and I colored it, took a picture and made a comic out of it. And then I entered it into the slide. So what I thought is like, my uh, presentation has one technical term called piezoelectric sensors. But if I didn't include that name in the slide, I don't think people will grasp it. And I cannot explain, if I don't explain what it is, I will kind of simplify my research too much. So I had to kind of find the balance. I'm sure this is the same with engineering presentations. If you see the three engineering presentations, I think there were some uh, words there. I think that's the reason. Erica, do you agree with me? Um, 1000% to the squared power. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I, would, I, I kind of had a similar approach to, to Erica with the like circle of life. Um, I think that if you're talking about a process, it's helpful to draw out the process. And again, as, as many of you said, with as few words as possible. Um, this, the, the slide that I had where you take a skin cell and then you convert it into a stem cell and then you add the gene and you give it back to the patient. That is a picture that in many different forms has existed in my lab for yeah, seven years. Um, originally like in a PowerPoint slide. And then when I joined the lab, I was like, ah, I've got to do this in Illustrator because it's only good if it's done in Adobe Illustrator. And eventually, um, we've cleaned it up and changed it over time. But for the purposes of this presentation, um, when I talked to my lab about how do I explain that therapeutic gene, um, a couple of people in my lab pointed out something like, and we couldn't remember what the actual term in Pac-Man was, but like, what if you make these cells as like Pac-Man? And my boss has actually pitched for doctors with little Pac-Man like walking across the screen. Um, and my boss then told me to go to a barcade and play uh, Pac-Man as research for this. <laughs> so that I could understand what part of Pac-Man was it that actually makes Pac-Man able to eat ghosts. Um, that's probably not a terribly applicable to everyone, but I would say when putting together a slide, if you're going to be talking about a process, drawing out that process, I think is really helpful. And then having something that's kind of uh, a, a bit unusual and memorable, like people kind of remember Pac-Man. So did your universities have um, uh, training sessions for the 3MT for you? Did, did, did they practice with you? Did they tell you beforehand, this is, this is a good technique and this is so kind of a workshop to prepare you for that event? There was a question from the audience. Is this something that your universities have offered? Anybody? Yeah. 
Yeah, so Purdue, um, they offered a couple um, like workshops that were open to anyone. Um, and then in the prelims, um, they took a video of us and um, I believe, I can't believe that, remember if they gave us feedback like right away or to the finalists. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to say you could like work again one more time. They had like a practice for the finals and get more individual feedback. And then for the finals at Purdue, um, yeah, that that's, so they did have workshops and I did find them really helpful. And they had like talked about different, you know, they had it from one of the deans who is specialized in communication and had us watch former big winning presentations and everything. So um, that was really, that was a really nice resource. And I think really helps get more students involved um, because then it's a lot less intimidating to at least like have a workshop you can go to and a guide and like a sequential process and then just like, bang, yeah. you got to figure it all out yourself. Yeah, we do it here on our campus as well. And I'm familiar that a lot of other graduate schools are doing that as well, having an information session, having feedback, showing um, other presentations. There are lots of videos out there from other folks doing it and kind of seeing you can kind of compare what winning um, uh, schools are, are doing. And speaking about winning, um, I do have the name of, of the winner. So, but first of all, I want to uh, congratulate all of you again. The, the fact that you've come here to the final and done such a fabulous job, each and every one of you is worthy of this um, particular uh, prize. So you all are winners, even if you are not chosen here as the People's Choice Award. I just wanted to tell you how, you know, how amazed, um, I can see the comments here in the chat, how amazed the audience is about your extraordinary abilities to really condense research into um, such a short condensed version that is still entirely engaging and understandable to the audience. So, but now without further ado, the winner of the People's Choice Award is Erica Graham, How Close is Too Close, University at Albany. Erica, would you like to say a few words? Wow. Um, I am absolutely speechless. Um, this, this is such an honor for me to be present, representing the University of Albany at the um, Council of Graduate Schools. Um, the love and support I've received from both you, Albany, and uh, SUNY Poly has been instrumental uh, for me to be able to stand here today. Um, and most importantly, I, I want to congratulate all of the presenters uh, that are here today and ones that were not able to join us. Um, your hard work has been palpable. Um, your research is amazing. Um, I've learned so much from the advice you've given. It's just, thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Well, congratulations. I would also like to thank again ProQuest for their generosity in uh, making this award uh, available. And uh, thank you very much for CGS and for the, all the staff members who worked with all the students and with me so that we come across halfway intelligent here today. So thank you to CGS. Um, and um, uh, it's a wonderful competition. And uh, for those of you out there who are not currently doing 3MT competitions, I hope this has been an inspiration to you to organize such an event. It is, um, you will see it is transformative for the students who are participating in it. It's transformative for the campus community. And it is such a great service to, um, to the public in general to really prepare students to be able to speak not only to do exciting and uh, very highly uh, significant research, but also to be able um, to compute, uh, to co communicate about it in such eloquent ways um, as all of the uh, presenters today, and in particular, our winner, Erica Graham. Congratulations again and celebrate. <laughs> all right, that concludes the presentation for today. I thank everybody for having uh, joined CGS here at this event. And um, we hope to see all of you at one of the future CGS presentations. Thank you very much.